<laughs> so we're just going to have a panel discussion now with a panel of very lovely um, experts from different fields. I'm just going to set my timer so I can keep an eye on the time. We've got uh, five people, uh, four of our panel members here in person, and we have um, two, two of our panel members online. So I'll just introduce everyone to begin with. So sitting next to me here is Bob Muir. Bob Muir is a Wapabara elder and traditional owner of the Keppel Islands in the southern Great Barrier Reef. He's currently employed at the Australian Institute of Marine Science as an Indigenous Partnership Coordinator with involvement in the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program and a major coral research project in the Keppel Islands. Bob has a vision for the future involved with the Wapabara people developing businesses on Wapa, uh, the name for Great Keppel Island, in tourism, accommodation, entertainment, education, supporting schools, healing retreats, ranges for working on sea country, research and surveys of sea country, walking tracks, weeds, fire management, cultural heritage management, and Bob says he plans never to retire. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you so much, Bob, for joining us today. Uh, next to Bob, we have Dr. Maxine Newlands. Maxine is a political scientist at James Cook University Townsville, working to understand how and why environmental politics and networks of communication transform policy making. Max has been working in the reef space for almost a decade. Her current projects include the Reef Res Restoration and Adaptation Program, Queensland Government's Reef Water Quality Program, Understanding Media Narratives of Reef Water Quality, and she has a new book coming out in 2022, Environmental Politics of the Great Barrier Reef. So keep your eye out for that one. Sitting next to Maxine is Dr Matt Kernock. Matt is a social environmental scientist working with the CSIRO based in Townsville. Matt has been working for the past two decades on numerous natural resource management, climate adaptation, tourism and Great Barrier Reef related projects, including integrated social and ecological monitoring programs. And he's also a really fabulous underwater photographer, so you may have seen some of his photos. And he was also responsible for the reef trip yesterday. So if you got to go on that, you can thank Matt. Sitting next to Matt is Miss Jean Erbacher. Jean is a program manager in the office of the Great Barrier Reef of the Queensland Department of Environment and Science. She's been working supporting agricultural industry programs and policy for GBR outcomes since 2009. Passionate about practical evidence-based programs, Jean works across disciplines partnering within government, industry, natural resource, research sectors and communities. Thank you, Jean. So online, and I'm not sure if we're able to show their faces if they're not speaking, but we have Associate Professor Karen Vella. Karen Vella is the head of, school, head of the School of Architecture and Built Environment at the Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane. Karen is an urban and environmental planner and her research interests focus on environmental and natural resources planning with particular reference to the human and governance dimensions of planned action. Karen leads research projects that explore the impact of policy tools and collaboration strategies on behaviour and decision making in the Great Barrier Reef. So thank you, Karen. And our other final online attendant is Professor Stuart Lockie. Um, Stuart is the director of the Cairns Institute at, the, at James Cook University. Over a long career, beginning in agricultural systems and sociology, Stuart's research has included community-based natural resource management, coastal zone management, biodiversity conservation, assisted ecosystem evolution, environmental policy, food security, social impact assessment, and the management of natural and industrial hazards. Among many other distinguished works, Stuart also co-leads several projects associated with the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program and Crown of Thorns Control and Innovation Program. So thank you, Stuart, for joining us as well. I think when our online participants speak, we will see their faces. Oh, there's a face. So Karen and Stuart, thanks for joining us. Um, if I could just have the questions back up briefly and then we'll get rid of those and we can have Karen and Stuart. So these are the, kind of the guiding questions for the panel. We were thinking the theme drawing together what we've talked about today is around integration and how many different facets of integration there are. So that can mean in any of the themes that we've talked about today between um, 
academic disciplines, between um, within social science disciplines, and so on. So there are guiding questions. And to begin with, I'll just direct some questions to various panel members, and then I think we'll encourage um, questions and comments um, for our panel members from the from the floor. So Stuart, I was going to put you in the hot seat first. Um, and what we had today, we actually had two discussion sessions where each table had an opportunity to say what they thought the urgent uh, priorities and gaps were. And actually, mostly nobody chose to answer that question, which I was really surprised at. I thought everybody would have their agenda slapped down on the table. So Stuart, could you give us your perspective on what you think are the urgent gaps and priority social science needs um, that need addressing for the Great Barrier Reef? You have to unmute first. <laughs> and <laughs> well, thanks, Michelle, and greetings, everybody from Irukandji country, where I'm honoured to speak from you to you from today. Um, Look, in a way, it's maybe the reluctance is because it's a little bit unfair with, you know, 14 presentations picking gaps because, you know, one of the things that stood out to me is that um, it's all day talking about social science research on the reef and no one's really addressed the productive effects of, of mobilising the reef symbolically as this, um, you know, cause celeb for global climate change action. Um, no one's really spoken about um, advocacy organisations and environmental NGOs. Yet we know um, Max has got a book coming out on it next year, so it's not as if that work's not happening. Um, it's, it struck me that the agenda today um, has been driven a lot by the urgency of climate action and the urgency of, of, of addressing a lot of um, quite practical and policy-relevant questions. And I suppose in terms of, you know, where I see maybe not a gap in, in everybody's work, but certainly a gap in our conversation so far, is the rest of the social science, you know, the, the, the deep theoretical, you know, methodologically reflective and difficult, inconvenient sort of work that 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 needs to be needs to be undertaken and i think that if we step back and ask ourselves what does a high impact research and engagement agenda for social sciences look like it will certainly focus on those immediate practical issues and it will focus on working with government and with management institutions but it will not restrict itself to those sorts of things it will engage with multiple publics, including those who are not currently involved in reef management. It will, it will, you know, be self, self-critical and reflective about its theoretical and methodological approaches. We won't just listen to people's outcomes, but we'll take the time to think. Well, what do they, what assumptions are embedded in that research? What happens if we question those? If we think about different assumptions, different theoretical and methodological approaches. I think we will be also more critical of government and policy settings, and we're going to. And, and I think we need to ask some really fundamental questions. It also it's unusual to me as a sociologist to be talking about the reef as if it's self-evidently a thing um, that doesn't need to be unpacked and explained. Um, because is the reef just an assemblage of fish and coral? Um, it's probably not, is it? You know, it's it's an it's it's a peopled landscape. It's an assemblage of knowledge and knowledge practices and institutions and culture and 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 history, all sorts of things. And you know, Tiff, Tiff you know, uh, uh, finished her talk with the question about you know um, whether we need to reconceptualise world heritage, and that really speaks to those sorts of big picture questions about what it is that we're talking about. And if we really think hard about climate change and its implications, we need to start taking our communities, our multiple publics, you know, into a very, into very deep reflection on difficult questions. Because it's not just about nitrogen management, but it, of course it is about nitrogen management, but it's about farming in a fundamentally different climate. You know? It's about fisheries management and, and living productively and constructively and giving our children, you know, beautiful lives 
in a very different environment? Yeah, and those are big questions that we won't address if we either take the sort of traditionally, you know, sort of what I think of as the sort of self-referential smart-ass approach to social theory, um, but we also won't address it simply by addressing the most immediate policy priorities. So that's what I see as probably not in the individual work that everybody does, but in, in our collective conversation to date as a major gap and priority. Nice, thank you, Stuart. Really nice um, reflections and probably a nice segue. I'd like to ask Karen um, a question. I know in a prior lifetime, Karen, that you've worked for a long time in the reef space. Uh, you've worked for the Marine Park Authority, you've worked for natural resource management organisations, also a long career in academia. And I just wanted to ask you, can you see in our current social science for the reef landscape, you know, continuity with the work you were doing, you know, maybe when you started your career and throughout the length of your career, is there continuity, is there disjuncture, can you see changes of direction that we've made in our social science work? Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, definitely. When I started working at Cabrumba 10 or so, 15, actually longer than that ago, it was a very different social science landscape. and. A lot of the work that I was doing with the colleagues that I was working with then was setting up some of the first types of social science studies that have continued to this day. So the economic and financial monitoring was one of the projects that I set up 15 years ago and, and that has been continued. And, and I was actually employed to um, pull together social science information for the first marine monitoring report, which of course has evolved over time into what is now RIMREP. And, you know, we're, we're still we're looking for ways to still fill some of those gaps. So there's continuity there, um, but still, I guess what hasn't changed is that there's still more information gaps and we've got, you know, good data to, to fill. So um, one of the things that I've noticed that's really changed over the last 15 or 20 years is that um, it's a friendlier environment for social science in the reef. And when I first started in management, it was quite a lonely place to be as a social scientist working in a management agency. And that wasn't because people weren't welcoming or didn't think that social science was really valued or had an important role to play, but it was not being able to kind of, I guess, fr being frustrated that I wasn't really well understood or couldn't have those um, kinds of connected conversations that this symposium has really brought to together today. It's so fantastic to see people having dialogues about, you know, what do you mean when you use the term um, social science or what, what, what do these things mean? Uh, that's fantastic that we're now at a place where we can look at that from different, different social science perspectives. I think one of the things I've noticed in terms of the themes that have changed over time is that we started from really trying to understand the users of the reef and the values of the reef um, and people's perceptions of management. And I think that strong focus on understanding how people perceive management has been really important in building that kind of public trust in management institutions. So I think that's in, you know an important place where science was. And now the dialogue is much more about how do we engage, how do we empower, how do we actually take action? And I guess one last thing I'd say is one of the things that I uh, really learned from being in a management agency, um, both government and non-government, is that it's full of passionate people and change is not only hard for the people kind of out there in the community, but making that happen is also really hard for managers within management institutions. And I've, that's been a really, um, I would say, probably one of the most influential things on my career. And in, you know, doing science, it's about coming up with information that can support those managers, but also in being an educator, it's about actually helping that next generation of professionals to really understand what can they do constructively to take action in these complex, unrelenting um, difficult management environments where everybody wants to do good, but sometimes it feels really overwhelming and help, hopeless. Yeah, thanks, Karen. Um, I'm not, I think I'll go to Jean next, if I could ask you a question, Jean. Um, from a Queensland 
government perspective and, and hearing what um, Stuart and Karen have reflected upon, what do you see as our um, urgent priorities or work that needs to be done or direction we need to go in with our social science research? Well, that's a big follow-on. Um, and it actually splits into two parts. If I'm going to take the widget approach, which is we have a Reef 2050 water quality improvement plan, and underneath that we have a set of knowledge gaps and responses that we need. Um, there are a suite that have been identified, but there's two drivers, and that's the fact that the Reef 2050 plan is due for review in 2023. And that next year, that means we're updating the land management targets and the scientific consensus statement, uh, which means that all the knowledge that we see in this room will be brought forward into that report. And that's actually a really important thing. So published papers and all of those things are really critical because I don't think the last scientific consensus statement, we were really able to explain the human dimensions theme. So it's a long way from where we were. When you look at the RDNI strategy, um, there were sort of eight identified gaps. And some of the projects you saw today were the ones that OGBR thought were important. And they included the partnership models and understanding the mechanisms that were available to people. Um, we still have more to do to understand the effective mix of that and where we might go next. That included um, the partnerships model um, and what makes effective partnerships and how can we apply that in our day-to-day -day business? Well, how would that guide us as managers? Uh, the market instruments, as well, um, John Rolfe did a piece of work, Anthea's work that she talked to today, and Max's work that she's doing on communications and benchmarking of social media and traditional media, how that informs what we do today today as managers. There are three or four gaps that we haven't yet addressed, um, and we won't have time to do them before the scientific consensus statement, that'll flow on. But we still want to look at the supply chains that influence the agricultural sector. and this. Because the Water Quality Improvement Plan is all about agricultural practice and urban land-based impacts on the reef, this is where the gaps came from at that knowledge time. Um, and that's peer-to-peer -peer and social behaviour. It's the supply chain. Where can you intervene within the supply chain to have maximum effect, to set up the system for success? And thinking of it as a system rather than an individual farmer. One of the future ones for us is the changing land use as well. Um, so when you see regions like the Burnett Mary converting from cane into horticulture, the resilience to climate in the future, understanding what that means f for us and our industries and for our response is really critical. But we have spent very little time visioning forward or having a look at what the potential impact. There's another piece of work which you would, I know Billy would really love to do, which is the culture artefacts and cultural norm study, which would help us understand who we're working with and what might help influence. That's actually also really important for us, because at the moment the Queensland Reef Water Quality Program is under re redesign. We're starting our new five-year program this year. So we've got a whole suite of evaluations that have been done from things like the MIPS that got presented earlier. Um, we have a legacy piece that we're about to do on behavioural change and insights projects. We've got a whole evaluation of projects. So we're looking for data from anywhere that says something works better than something else in terms of an outcome and what should we be considering as we go forward and do our future investment. Now, if I stepped out of that <laughs> into what I, I sort of wonder about, there's a couple of things on the bigger picture. Engaging with traditional owners. I was recently asked to have a look at how in the agricultural practice space could I engage with traditional owners and I really struggled. And I'm, and I'm really thinking through what Peter said this morning because if you looked at it from the traditional of management of cane land, management of horticulture land, yeah, possible on grazing lands in indigenous sector and country, very difficult in other space. But if you think about it as a future, when I was talking with some other people in my office, so I'm not going to take this as my idea, but it was thinking about the future of bush foods. It's thinking about other engagement in the water quality monitoring space. There are other opportunities which we have the power to create into the future. And I think that's going to be all part of the climate change response. So in the bigger policy space, the Office of the Great Barrier Reef and Queensland Government would really be interested in those conversations around where are the opportunities that we can capture on. Mm, great. I'm going to stop there. Thank you, Jean. That's probably a nice segue to a question to Bob. 
Um, Bob, if I could ask you, um, you know, we've heard um, a lot, we heard today Peter really started our day talking about connecting and, and you know, it's great that we are doing acknowledgement of traditional owners and understanding that that's what we need to do, but how do we move past that? So I know you're doing amazing work at the moment with the Indigenous partnership teams at AIMS that's really focused on free, prior and informed consent. So my question to you would be is where do you think we go after that and how do we move this work really forward for genuine co-management with traditional owners? Yes, thank you. Um, I suppose, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the country where I'm speaking. Thank you. Um, with the business of the FPIC, the Free Prior and Informed Consent, and how we're sort of operating in AIMS, it really is a, a new process that um, we've adopted the, from the uh, UNESCO uh, indigenous rights of, um, of rights of indigenous people, and in that process, it's something where it, it's all about um, us sort of going out and giving out as much information as we can to the traditional owners before we go on to their country with any type of project, um, and we have to really give them all the information that we can. Um, and at the moment, I'll use the RAP as an example where. We have to, um, we've had traditional owners ask, how come you're collecting 5,000 pieces of coral? <clears throat> uh, how many pieces of coral are you collecting in my region? Uh, how much sand are you collecting? Um, so it really, um, coming down to fine detail in some areas where they want to understand what's happening on their country. Um, but I think just stepping back a bit with the FPIC process uh, and the engagement that we're doing, it really is something that we're hearing from the traditional owners themselves in a way that it's like a breath of fresh air. It's a new way of doing business. They've never been engaged that way before. Um, we've talked to a few traditional owners who've been involved with lots of different research on their country, universities, government. And some of the complaints that we've heard already is just the fact that there's no um, follow-up. There's no, they don't see the, the outcomes or the, the, you know, the products from those sort of meetings. Uh, and that engagement. So it was sort of disappointing to hear that some of the reports and things they don't even get back about what happens on their country. So it, it's something with um, the traditional owners basically have said that it, it's really heartfelt when they tell us thanks for the engagement process because um, it's completely new for them. And, and I suppose I haven't got to the point that's new to them is the fact that if they say no, we just don't go there. Um, and they, they will say no for different reasons and we've had that already and some of it's just simply the governance structure, some of it's native title, some of it's sorry business, some of it's just coming back and see us in six months. Um, so I think what happened with the FPIC process is that we really do um, get that engagement in a way where we're lucky in some respects because all traditional owners want to look after their country. And when we come along, it's another way that they can actually look at managing their country when we talk to them. And it's about knowing what's on your country as well. Uh, you know, for a lot of traditional owners out there, they really have got some great management plans in place. They've got tumras, and they really look after their country. The last thing they need is some boat rocking up in their country, and they don't know what he's doing there. And meanwhile, that person's already done the right thing by LAW and got all the permits and everything. But when it comes to the LORE, the law of the traditional owners, you sort of leave them out and they, they're they asking the same question. So it's a big embarrassment in some respects that you're managing country and there's something happening there that you don't know about. So it's something with this process now with FPIC and the engagement side of it. Um, and RAP is a, another good example where <clears throat> these things were planned two years ago and we're only just talking to the traditional owners now. And the first thing we have to tell them is there's no money. There's no funds in this program for you. Um, and, you know, that's a bit of the truth telling, I suppose, that we have to do when we sit down with traditional owners. And one of the things, I come back to truth telling, and when AIM sits down with a traditional owner, especially like Wappaburra, sat down and said, we've been working in your country for 40 years, and this is the first time we've talked to you. So, that's sort of been happening everywhere. But AIMS now, uh, by going out and telling that the truth-telling, I used to call it confessions of a scientist, <laughs> but 
the truth-telling process is really something that um, does open the doors. There is uh, usually shock from the elders that you've been doing this and you've what? You've got this collection in your way, you know, and all this sort of stuff that's been going on that we never knew about. So with this engagement process, it really is opening the doors to um, engaging in a really deep, meaningful way. And I suppose with engagement, sometimes we think of just hiring a hall for two hours and doing a presentation. That's the normal old engagement. But for me nowadays, it's more about just sitting down having a cup of tea to begin with. And you might have to do that two or three times before you can get a meeting. Um, so it, it's something that's, a, you know, you, it just won't happen overnight. And I, I suppose the other thing with FPIC, and even though there's no dollars there, we actually get the researchers and the scientists in to talk to the traditional owners about their project and what they're going to do. And that is the beginning of a relationship. And that's the beginning of maybe gaining their trust. And I, I, I suppose one of the biggest issues or one of the biggest things I've seen as far as barriers with government agencies and a lot of other different people trying to engage with traditional people is the first thing they say is we don't know who to talk to or that's too hard. And so what you get is this sort of process where we don't really get engaged. And, you know, I, I sort of... Sometimes I get that nickname, I'm you know, being called a tape recorder because I get sick of repeating myself. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of things going on out there where if you want traditional owners involved, get them at the table first. Get them there right there at the beginning when you're just talking about it. Even if you're not going to... And even if it doesn't pan out there, you're going to include them. Um, I, I hate... I mean, in my position, when we start talking about any traditional owners, I actually make sure and just give them a heads up. We're talking about you fellas. We might be in your region soon. This is what we're looking at. And it's just a heads up. It, instead of going in there a year later and saying, oh, we've been discussing this for a year now, and we'd like your input. It's not co-designed. It's not co-management. There's no partnership there. You're sort of still leaving us to last. And, you know, I, I sort of go back to that business and, well, if you're in business, um, you've got to look at everything when you're doing a business and any perceived negatives or barriers or any issues like that, you have to plan for that. You have to manage it and budget for it. At the moment, traditional owners get left to last and then there's no money in the budget for them and then the budget blows out because it takes another six months for you to talk to us. So it's not a really good way of doing business um, and I've seen this going on for years. So. And, you know, even though I'm a bit negative, things are changing. Definitely things are changing, and here today is a great example of that. Um, but for me, the business at the moment of going through FPIC and gaining that relationship and that trust will start a, re a process where the traditional owners might sit down with that researcher and look at a project they want done in their country. And that way you end up working with the traditional owners for what they want and what they want to do in their country instead of going in with, uh, we'd like to look at the mud crabs today or check out the water. It's, it's really more about just engaging and getting them involved. It, and, you know, it, it's something... I'm, and I think one, once you do that, and I'm for sure a few people in this room can say and agree with me, is that you actually learn more. You actually get to understand more what's happening in that region before you even get out there by talking to the traditional people. And then you can plan your project or your process and, in a way that it will actually work together for both people. You know, because I remember years and years ago, an auntie telling me, what are them scientists doing up our creek? Are they studying some three-eyed prawns or something? What are they doing there? And, you know, this is years ago, this is 30, 40 years ago when this sort of language is around. We're doing things on our country and we never knew what you were doing there. And so I suppose that's just another thing that it's a bit of a hangover and that's the way we've been dealt with in the past, where you're going to look at a bit of a defensive sort of process where you come in and talk to us, we're very defensive at the moment and we might be aggressive simply because we've been flogged and told too many times this is what's going to happen but nothing does. So it is something which um, it has to change and you know what I see here today and the business and social side of things is very important and it can make a change in the way we do business. You know, it, just even the dollars that go into Indigenous programs. I've never seen a social sort of process looked at the actual dollar value for that dollar. You, you know, you get three ranges on a country. 
you think you've just paid money for that. Well, you end up with a, only getting a job making the sandwiches, maybe. You have someone down the road making more coffee. So it has an impact everywhere. And, and that's something that, you know, I've learned through the council and I used to work there that, that, you know, just by employing one person, it has a lot of impacts. And when you're talking traditional owners, that impact is massive, especially like with rangers. Uh, the business of traditional owners and rangers at the moment, all of our young people want to be a ranger. And that's great, but there's only five positions or whatever in your local country to be a ranger. And then the rangers that are there want to stay there because it's such a great job. So we have this issue where everyone wants to be a ranger, but we can't accommodate them. We can't sort of offer other programs to get them involved and offer programs for them rangers to get that succession planning going. Uh, and, and then, you know, you think, well, that old ranger, you should get another job. Well, there's no other job there. So that's, it's a big issue where, you know, I'm no, no answer for, but I thought I'd just try and pass that on and make us aware. But I think um, for me at the moment, the business of relationship, sitting down talking, building up that trust is one of the most important things you'll do. Um, and I suppose the other side of that is that you will cop a flogging. Sometimes you'll walk in and you'll get your head ripped off or whatever, simply because the last person in there did the wrong thing. All I can do is say, you know, please just stand there and be, encourage you to just sort of face it and, and accept it in some respects. Don't be defensive. Just take it on board. And I think what you might find after a while is you'll gain the respect of those people simply because you're still there, you listened and you heard what they were saying instead of walking out of the room saying this is too hard. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Really appreciate it. It's always hard to stand and take a tell enough, but <laughs> sometimes worth it. Um, I'll just pass to Matt Kernock if I could, um, just going off your last comment there about trust, um, and that's something that came up a lot today. Um, we had a, talk, a lot of talk about trust, and trust not just being audience focused, but also about changing our own practice. Um, and I wanted to ask you, Matt, you know, what are your thoughts on how we build trust and acceptance and engagement in social science research and practice that trans translates into behaviour change? Um, and that means not just behaviour change of who we think of as our target audience, but also beha behaviour change for us as practitioners, which, you know, Bob has been um, speaking about and Peter also spoke about this morning. Um, thanks, Michelle, and thank you, yeah. Bob, for that. Um, uh, talk as well. Um, I think that's a really um, difficult question to answer, actually. Um, how, how do you build trust? I, I, so my um, research includes uh, uh, le leadership of a, of a monitoring program, social economic long-term monitoring program for the Great Barrier Reef, um, and we, we monitor trust in the community. Um, in, the, in the Great Barrier Reef community of the, ca the catchment, so the, the population of residents um, from Bundaberg up to, to Cape York. Um, and uh, it's, it's very clear that um, trust underpins um, reef management. Um, it underpins social licence for, for any initiatives that, that you know, managers undertake to, to look after and manage um, the land and the sea. Um, it underpins uh, the work that we do as, as scientists um, and it's an incredibly important thing, uh, as we've noted from numerous discussions um, today. Um, so, um, it's, so I, I don't know exactly, I'm not a practitioner about, that can give advice on building trust, but I, I can perhaps speak to the, some of the components in measuring and monitoring trust. Um, and um, it, it boils down to, to two major um, components in, in, from literature. There's, there's quite a growing um, body of literature on, the, on this, on trust. Um, and if, if you want um, two take home points, um, one would be competence. Um, so that's um, you know, competence, to trust, if it's trust in an institution or trust in a person, they have to be competent at what they, what they do. Um, so that's consistency of delivery, um, evidence-based approach, um, balance, um, diligence um, and procedural fairness in what they do. Um, the other um, major component of trust is, is, is warmth or empathy, so um, sharing the same values in order to gain trust. So those shared values um, 
uh, speaking a common language uh, are clearly um, very important. Having clear, shared goals, um, having understandable methods. Um, uh, and, and I think this is where a lot of our work um, around engagement um, comes in. So it's, it's about meaningful engagement uh, includes genuine listening uh, and participatory approaches where people are engaged from, from the very beginning of a process rather than, than retrofitted at some point um, when the design is already um, partly formed. Um, and also, Bob, you mentioned the follow-up, the lack of follow-up. I think that's a, that's a, that's a critical component for maintaining trust, closing the feedback loop. So scientists have an obligation to report back to the people that they, they study and they engage with on what they've found. And, and sometimes that, that doesn't happen in a timely fashion or sometimes not at all. So um, I, I, I don't want to dwell too long on that, but it, in, in um, well, I think another part is of, of that you know, empathy and warmth is acknowledging the uncertainty and risk. So the truth telling is, is another key part of it. Um, so in the, the monitoring that we've been doing um, since uh, 2013, um, it's been repeated at four-year intervals. We collected data in 2013, 17, and just uh, in the last couple of months uh, on the Great Barrier Reef. And what we've learned is, is there is um, very high trust in scientists, in reef science, very high trust in the community for reef managers. Um, and I think that puts us in a very privileged position to be trusted. Um, you might not get that impression from social media studies. Um, for, for example, uh, you know, the, the controversy and the polarisation that you, that you pick up in social media narratives, but uh, if you go to the population, um, you, know, you, you realise that, that that social media is dominated, those narratives are dominated by a fringe. So we, we need to be reassured that we are trusted by the majority of people out there in the community when it comes to reef science. But at the same time, we have to treat that very um, carefully and respectfully. Uh, we, we certainly cannot take that for granted. We all have a very important role to play in building and maintaining that in the work that we do. Thanks, Matt. So, Max, um, I'm going to say a nice curly question for you for last. Um, someone made a comment today about there was people that weren't here in the room and there's a lot of people that are not in the room today and that is partially deliberate. It's, it's actually totally deliberate but I'll just say it's partially deliberate. But, um, so I know that many of you would have been to um, reef conferences and you find yourself um, in a panel or a session that is just all the people you already know that work in the same field as you and they're also all social scientists. So there's, we're still working in a very biophysically dominated space. So our, our goal today was to get together as a group of social scientists or people, practitioners, you might call yourself working in the social science space, to see who we are, to have a chance to talk to each other, hear about each other's work, and to also create a presence, you know, create our own presence in this space. So the question that I'd like to pose to you, Max, is like going forward now, what do we do with this, that we have our social science community for the reef, we have an identity as a group of social scientists working in the reef space, how do we really um, achieve better social natural integration? And that's not only in data, but also in our conversations. So like starting being part of the problem framing rather than just being asked to, you know, insert social science information here at, you know, 2.3 or whatever. That's more than one question. <laughs> Um, I actually think uh, right at the beginning when Stuart said about integration, I do think that's a really, really important term. Um, and also around the symbolicness of the reef and uh, like Yolanda's work, talk, touching on earlier work around cell temp, I think it was. And, um, but I think the thing that you need to kind of flip this, okay. And I've been in the room where examples you've gave and, and stuff. And we have a skill set that scientists don't have, biophysical science, if you like. And, you know, I work in politics and communication. And the hardest thing with science is, and, and sort of the whole community, is getting it into the public and getting the public to understand. And that works through politics and it works through cultural change and it works through communication. And we have that skill set. We have the theoretical underpinning. We have the methodology and the understanding. And, you know, we understand what motivates people to build trust or not be trusted. 
We understand what motivates and drives people in order to engage. So I think on a very superficial level, we actually have a really good skill set that we need to share and almost, you know, get the scientists out of the lab. And I'll just give you one example from the R app as well. When you said that about, you know, you have scientists on country and they've got coral in their labs. I was in one of those meetings early on and it wasn't, um, it wasn't rudeness and it wasn't indignant, it was complete naivety from the science perspective. It was a lack of understanding and a lack of knowledge of how country works, uh, of traditional owner knowledge and of, you know, and of sort of ownership. And, and that's all about small politics. That's not governance structure, that is systemic, but it's about understanding small politics, politics with a small P, the everyday politics, the things that why petrol costs X amount at the Bowser, as I always tell my students. And we have those kind of, but it's more than the skills and the how. So I think, you know, another example from our rap, and, and um, I have to give a nod to Bruce Taylor, I don't know if he's still on the line, but we have so many conversations in the early days where social science becomes an, a, a second thought. Oh yeah, we'll do this, this and this. In the two years in the proof of concept phase from our app, they took it from basically, yeah, and yeah, yeah, social license, you know, not to be uh, dismissive. We took it to becoming across um, all programs. So we had columns of, of all the different forms of biophysical science, and then we had our, our traditional owner column and our social science, and I'm being quite blunt here. And by the end of the project, through a whole load of processes, that became cross-cutting. And it is cross-cutting across the RRAP. So that is why, you know, you're working on it, I'm working on it. And I think there was about 10 of us social scientists that started back in uh, two years ago. There's about 45, 50 of us now working on the RRAP project. So, so that's an example where we integrated and we really kind of used our knowledge to inform the scientists. So now when the scientists go on country, they ask permission and they understand what they're doing, you know, why they're doing it. So there's just sort of, so I think really what I'm saying there is it's about a cultural change. You know, it's about a shift away from that. And we're all in our little um, disciplines and we actually need to be cross-cultural. And I think I want to touch on Peter's comments this morning. You know, we all, scientists as well as social scientists, who we're going to separate it out like that, natural and social, however you want to call it, um, we all face similar barriers, but we also face similar enablers, like the symbolicness of the reef, like the identity of the Aust Australian identity of the reef. And I think it's about coming together and spotting those barriers and also spotting those enablers and kind of sharing that sort of um, area, because ultimately we know it's about reef health. You know, yeah, no, for some people it's about their own agenda and their own politics and that kind of thing. But broadly speaking, it's about reef health. So I think, going back to your second question, which you snuck in, it's also about problem framing. It's about m explaining, not just to the biophysical scientists, you know, why do they do that science? Like, what's the, the so what, the why? You know, you can, you can reframe lots of things. And I think as long, if you reframe it, you bring more people along. So that kind of would be another way. And you can do that through the skill sets that, um, that we have and the, the underpinning. And I think that also then, if you give people the skill sets and share that skill set, they can understand why policy is developed, can understand at a simple level why a grant might not be you know, given, because it doesn't align with the policy or the research objectives of that government. You know, but it might align with something else. So it's also about having that kind of knowledge. And then the final one is the big one, is the media. And it, again, what is the motivation for people? Most of the reef is politicized in the media, but not probably in this room. Well, apart from me and Tiffany, who are the two political kind of science geographers. But uh, you're right, you know, social media is all about uh, a small number of people amplifying a certain message. And it's the classic, I'm not no psychologist, but you say it often and, and often enough people believe it, whether it's true or not. But if you understand the motivations of why that's happening and why that certain message is being pushed, then it's a lot easier to counter it. So I think understanding the way communication changes, and it's all these things. Some of this is politics with the big P, this is structural, this is systemic, and some of it is actually on the ground, working with scientists, cross-cutting, working with TOs, but all of, we're all in the same space. We all are working in the reef. I think that's exactly what, you know, Peter was talking about this morning. What is our legacy? It's not 
it's not my legacy and your legacy and you know someone from Ames it's everyone's legacy so to summarize <laughs> I think integration um, understanding both politics big P and small P and I think Bob's right as well we need to look at a new way of doing things nice thanks Max I just want to open to the floor now. Does anybody have questions for the panel or panel members? If you had anything you wanted to say, address comments of anyone else that's spoken already. Don't be shy. You get to have drinks at five o'clock if you ask a question. <laughs> now I'm going to bribe you. No. <laughs> yeah, Bob said don't ask at five o'clock. Ask your questions now. Other panel members, feel free to comment too if you have more you'd like to say. How can, um, How can um, communications professionals who aren't social scientists work better with the data that social scientists find to communicate some of these big issues for the reef? I'll leave that open to anyone who would like to answer. Go on then, Matt. <laughs> um, oh. <laughs> I, I was just going to say a really brief um, part of that is I, I think social scientists need to work with communicators to craft those messages. So um, I, I think there are a lot of uh, managers who understand science quite well, but pr probably far fewer scientists who understand management needs. And, and um, so I think that engagement needs to happen there. Yep. I totally agree. And, and I, um, you know, actually, the literature on media and reef is quite small. And there's about six or seven of us that are writing about that. So we've just done this study um, with Jean and, and Billy for Des, and it's about establishing that baseline. But until we, we kind of need to know what we're dealing with before we can help you know, and pass that information on. And we're sort of getting there now, but it's a little bit too, it's a bit like the social science being less to laugh. The media has been less, less left till last so but maybe we could talk about this offline and I can tell you about the stuff that's not published yet so I don't want to say it here. It will be published yes. Jean? It, it will be published by Christmas time <laughs> or as a technical report or something by Christmas time or out there. I think the key thing that I learned from the process of working with Max was there is different languages. Um, I've always known as somebody who works in a government that our language is bureaucratic. It's really hard to simplify it down to be something that's not, but we have to get better at it as part of the communications. And some of the things that were protectionist is also it requires a change of our communicators, and that's challenging as well, especially in an environment which is highly political and you report to a minister and you have to follow the government of the day. And so that includes the messages in the way we want to work. So the more data we have and the more understanding of how it works at a local level, the better, because then we can work with our local partners and look at how we communicate better. Thank you. Anyone, any comments from online there? Stu and Karen? No? Oh, oh Bob. Oh, oh Karen, go. Sorry, <laughs> I was just going to say, it's a really good question and I think uh, like, like most things it's be really good to kind of deepen that relationship between I think some of the governance and, and planning work that we do and, and communications because sometimes you know and I've done countless media trainings where you kind of sit with a journalist and you talk to them about what you do and then they go oh that's not really very interesting for me to actually do a story on because it's like it's not a bad news story so kind of finding a way to frame that in a way that um, you know, kind of allows us to get the messages out is something that I don't think I've nailed. And so from, from my perspective, deepening that relationship with um, communications experts is the key to working out how to actually start framing that in the way that can um, have more, you know, more broad scale application. Thanks, Karen. Bob? I've, I've got no answers, but I suppose really it's um, something where People, even the reporters, um, the cameramen, sometimes they're really trying to do the right thing. But uh, we just mentioned there before, if it's not bad news, it gets dropped off the list. If there's a robbery that day or COVID or something else, that good news story gets dropped off. Um, and, and I suppose for me, just one of the other observations from myself is sometimes 
no matter how good you sit down with that reporter and try and do a good story for half an hour, it's usually the editor that just grabs 30 seconds of you saying, no, that's no good, or something like that to highlight it. And, and it really is something that, you know, even just recently with a project that's happening, um, there was sort of language as far as trying to talk about saving the reef and different things and how we're looking at a new project. And it's called Reef, reef Song, basically. And it's about the sounds of the reef, the healthy sounds of a reef. Um, but one of the scientists tried to explain that it sounds a bit like baking frying underwater. So guess what the headline was? <laughs> so it, it really sort of mixed the ho lost the whole message, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, you know, for me, I have no real answer, except that sometimes I think the business of uh, editors and... Um, them trying to get numbers through the door or through the, on TV to watch is the issue. I think we had... Uh, Can I just add something from uh, Zoom? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, you go Max, just, then we'll go to Zoom. I you. You're right, and it's, but that's what I'm trying to say. It's about what are the drivers. So the reason that happens is because it's all about click-throughs, particularly. And it's also, if you choose to talk to News Corp, you'll get a different response to talk to The Guardian and things. So it's about the systemic understanding that, yeah, bacon frying, unfortunately, is a bad, not a good thing to say, but um, it's not necessarily bad news. It's just more about, is this going to drive advertising? That's unfortunately what the bottom line comes down to. And it's not the science at the moment. Sorry. No, that's okay. If we could take the question from Zoom so we're not neglecting our online. Yeah, we have a question from uh, online from Anthea Coggan. And it's about uh, how to better communicate scientific results. So it's uh, about a comment that we had during the talks. Um, um, yeah, that some people often have uh, trouble accessing scientific journals, for example. And what, uh, or the question is, are journals or reports the best way to disperse information? Or what, uh, how could we, or as scientists, communicate findings better? Who's got the microphone box after it? Oh, go on. Um, yeah, hang on, I just lost my train of thought then, sorry. <laughs> Cindy's telling me I should be answering this question. What should I be saying? <laughs> you answer it. Give Cindy the microphone. Oh, okay. Then. Knowledge brokers, yeah. You can answer, Cindy. Go on. Oh, OK. <laughs> so this is... I was thinking this earlier, actually. Um, there is actually this... I, I, so I was in academia for 10, 15 years, and now I've been in government for three years, and it's very clear to me that there's a lot of goodwill on both sides, but there's this gap that we need to fill that is like a knowledge broker role. So it's unrealistic to expect people in management to actually read your papers most of the time because they have all this day-to-day -day business. Um, see, my timer telling me to shut up. Um, they have this day-to-day -day business that um, doesn't, you know, give them time for that or they're not, you know, it doesn't make sense when they read these academic papers. And I think um, vice versa, there's this different language being used in management. So you'll be speaking to someone and not realising you're speaking a different language. So there is this knowledge broker role. And I think a first step for all of us is actually just realising that we need to have that process of knowledge brokerage and it often takes several conversations to even realise that you are using the same language with a different concept attached to it. So I can see all these people going, yeah, I've had that experience, yeah. So what Cindy and I try really hard to do and Jess Stella is our natural science um, lead in the authority is play that knowledge broker role and have that recognition that there is this gap between science and management that it needs a skill set in the in between um, to to play that brokerage role just um, one of the things that we're doing at Ames is the business of um, producing a fact sheet of the project and we sit down with the scientists and um, we are we, we send them nine questions that they have to answer the scientists and because it's framed about what we believe the traditional owners need to know and, and, and involvement. And with that fact sheet, we get those questions from the uh, talk to the scientists and get an understanding of what they want to do on the project. And then our little team sits down and makes it more, um, I don't know, user-friendly is the word, I suppose, that we can actually sit down with the traditional owners and talk to them. 
that fact sheet is important. We actually send that out to them a few weeks before the meeting, so they are prepared and got an idea if they've got questions or issues that they want to ask. Uh, they're prepared already. And, and, you know, that fact sheet, some of the language that's in there, um, and, you know, simple things like people saying juvenile coral. coral. Well, when you're talking to traditional people, when you say juvenile, you're thinking of the bad thing. Someone locked up or was problem child or at risk, you know, so we just got rid of that word. Instead of saying juvenile, you know, and we've said baby and other things like this. Some just very simple words uh, that we've used to make that difference. So, um, and, and so far, those fact sheets and what we're doing, um, the scientists are all involved. They sign off it, on it as well. So it's all done in a way that uh, we get their approval as well before we hand it out. So that's just one mechanism anyway at the moment that we're dealing with it. Thanks, Bob. I think we've got time for just one more question. If there is, oh, sorry, online. Who is Stuart? Thanks, Michelle. Um, I think it's important in considering, um, you know, how to facilitate effective knowledge brokering and transfer, not to um, start conceptualising social sciences as a technical exercise in collecting information that people can apply to solve problems. Um, in most cases, data do not speak for themselves and the results of individual studies do not speak for themselves. And so whilst brokering and getting better access to scientific outputs and all of those things are really important, um, it's just as important that there is a discussion around, you know, the synthesis, a discussion around the meaning. And if we go back a bit to your question of Bob about, um, you know, Trish Liners and co-management, you know, one of the critical aspects of those sorts of conversations is, you know, the question of where authority to interpret data and results come from and, and what weight you place on that. Um, you know, it, it, it involves the small p politics that Maxine was talking about. Um, and it, and it involves the sort of deliberative processes that Claudia presented on earlier. Um, you know, the transfer, and, you know, when I first saw this question, I thought, well, um, try and get yourself an adjunct appointment at a university. That'll solve the problem pretty quickly because you'll get access to the library. But, you know, it's, much, it's a much bigger issue than getting access to data and papers. Yes. I agree. Was there, um, just, I think we have time for one more question. Oh, we've got two. Holly's going to hand up and Yolanda's got a hand up. Maybe a nice finishing question. Where do you see social science on the reef in 10, 20 years from now? Domination, total world domination. <laughs> I'll let someone else answer that. <laughs> Karen, do you want to answer that question? Feels like I'm in a job interview. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? Um, uh, yeah, I, I, think, um, I think social science and the reef is on a, on a trajectory. I don't think um, that trajectory is going to stop. I'm, I'm hoping that it's going to grow. I, I think events like this are really important in um, building the capacity of the social science network to maintain consistency in the ebbs and flows of um, project funding, which kind of influences all of the social science work that we do. I think having those enduring networks will actually help maintain momentum in the social science system in the GBR. Um, you know, I don't think I can be more specific than that, but I think I would like to see um, some other social sciences come into the, um, the network, like Stuart said earlier, um, you know, the more theoretical social sciences that are not so defined by, um, you know, uh, I guess, immediate information needs, um, because it is that pure social science research of now that will help us with the applied social science of the future. And so I think that would be amazing. And and also, I think some of the other experiential social sciences, which uh, I think can really help to uh, scale 
some of our um, engagement and participation conversations, whether that's in um, programs like the ARA or for water quality, I think we've relied on types of engagement tools in the GBR and I'd really like to see experiential social sciences and what they have to offer the conversation around how do we uh, deepen and make engagement more meaningful for more diverse types of um, stakeholders and communities and, um, and rights holders in the reef. Did you have something you wanted to add, Matt? You've got the microphone there. No. I, I was I was just going to I, I was going to agree with your statement, your earlier statement. Actually, in ten to twenty years, I think social science is going to have a much bigger footprint um, in in reef management um, by necessity because we're dealing with more and more complex problems um, from year to year. The you know change is compounding upon change, and uh, it you know the. It's a, it's a human problem, so we need human solutions. From, um, even in the last five years in DES, you're starting to see it embedded in our programs, and uh, it's that and the economic and the market mechanisms and the long-term solutions is just going to drive it. And so I hope that not only is it greater, but it's also embedded. Okay, well, I think we'll thank our panel members and um, we'll close the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. I was, if I may, take an opportunity to, on our behalf, to express our thanks to the organising committee and in particular to Michelle and Cindy for pulling off this remarkable <laughs> symposium. Under very challenging circumstances, I, I think this has been a resounding success and um, um, you know, I, I, we should all um, feel very encouraged about the future of this forum and, uh, and, and just really well done. Thank yeah. you. We all should shout you a drink. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, thank you.